So yeah, firstly, I want to I want to thank the Physiological Society for having me uh, involved this afternoon, and also for helping me get here all the way um, from Australia. It's been an interesting, uh, an exciting couple of days, uh, and I've really enjoyed my time in London, despite the cold weather. Um, so my background is in exercise physiology uh, and sports science. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about the effects of sleep duration on the performance and cardiac autonomic function of uh, endurance cyclists. So athletes face many sleep challenges during training and competition. And in fact, they're often unable to achieve the minimum seven hours per night that is typically recommended for good health. Despite this, Anecdotally, at least, we hear that some of the most successful athletes of our time are big sleepers, and Roger Federer and Usain Bolt are just a couple of examples. So the assumption is that sleep is important for athletic success, but surprisingly few studies have actually looked at the effects of sleep on the sports-specific performance of athletes. We have some evidence, for example, uh, extending the sleep of college tennis players for one week has been shown to improve tennis serving accuracy, and during tournament play, higher ranked netball teams have been shown to sleep longer than, than lower ranked teams. Um, but what about endurance performance? So endurance athletes experience really high levels of physical and psychological stress uh, during training and competition. And so the recovery benefits of sleep might be particularly important um, for these athletes. So the primary aim of the study I'm gonna show you today was to really look at the effects of sleep, particularly sleep duration, on the recovery of endurance cycling performance. That leads me to my secondary aim, which was to, to investigate whether any changes in performance could be detected or predicted uh, by cardiac autonomic or heart rate indices. Now, heart rate indices are used by sports scientists as kind of a global measure of an athlete's uh, well-being or fatigue levels, um, so that training or recovery can be adjusted before an injury, uh, in real time before an injury or, or overtraining occurs. Uh, and so lots of different heart rate indices have been used for this purpose. But if I can show you just one example on the screen there, um, looking at heart rate variability. So heart rate variability, you may know, is um, the variation in time between successive heartbeats. And typically, um, it's, when it's high, it indicates an athlete is well rested um, and healthy. And so this study, uh, these data is um, daily heart rate variability of two triathletes in the lead up to a World Cup race. So these are elite triathletes and the race day there is shown as the black line. And you can see that for a successful athlete, um, this athlete achieved their pre-race goal. Um, their heart rate variability remained consistent and, and, and high in the lead up to the race, whereas for an unsuccessful athlete, there was kind of a steady um, drop off prior to the race. So we just wanted to see whether, whether these heart rate indices were sensitive to the effects of sleep on performance. So I recruited uh, nine competitive cyclists to complete a three-armed crossover study. So there was a sleep restriction condition, a normal sleep condition, and a sleep extension condition. So each condition required four consecutive days of testing. Uh, and, and the cyclists slept normally or habitually prior to the first day, of, of the first testing day of each condition. And then for the subsequent three nights, we prescribed bedtimes. So for the sleep restriction condition, we um, reduced their time in bed by 30%. For the normal sleep condition, they, they kept it as normal. Um, and for the sleep extension condition, we extended their time in bed by 30%. And so we monitored um, their sleep using actigraphy from two days before the first um, testing day to two days post the, the fourth testing day. So what did the testing days actually involve? So it was obviously an endurance performance test. So this was an individualized workload time trial. So we gave them a set amount of work to complete as fast as, as they could. Um, and this was calculated to take approximately um, one hour. We obviously recorded um, their performance time. And then we, we also recorded during the time trial their rating of perceived exertion. Before the time trial, we recorded our heart rate indices. So um, we recorded heart rate, uh, resting heart rate, sorry, and heart rate variability. And then we also had them do a submaximal exercise test at 60% of their VO2 max. And so uh, with the heart rate data from this test, we were able to curve fit that heart rate data, data and get, a, get an index of the maximal rate of their heart rate increase, so how responsive their autonomic nervous system is at the start of exercise. And we also looked at their heart rate recovery after that test. Prior to the time trial, we also recorded some psychometric indices, namely the profile of mood states and the psychomotor vigilance task. 
So what did we find? So on the left here, we have our control uh, variable. So this is our total sleep time. Uh, and the good news is that our intervention did work. So the, the main area of interest there is the shaded, not sure if you can see it, yeah, the shaded area there in grey are our three intervention nights where we prescribed uh, our bedtimes. And you can clearly see that um, there's a significant difference in the, the total sleep time achieved between the three conditions. On the right, we have the graph of our time trials across the four consecutive days. Uh, and so for time trial one, there was no difference uh, in our time trial performance, uh, which is to be expected. This was our baseline time trial. All, um, for all conditions, the cyclists slept normally prior to this time trial. But also for time trial two, so even after one night of those sleep interventions, there was no difference um, in time trial performance. After two nights of sleep uh, restriction, we start to see the performance is impaired in that sleep restriction trial because it was a slower time trial performance compared to the other <laughs> conditions. And it's trending this way again for the time trial four, although the large variability meant that this was not um, statistically significant. But for us, the really kind of interesting and, and exciting finding um, was that after three nights of sleep extension, you can see uh, at the end of the graph there, um, time trial performance was quicker not only compared with uh, restricted sleep, three nights of restricted sleep, but also compared with three nights of normal sleep. So this is kind of a new and, and novel finding. And to put that into perspective, that improvement after three nights of sleep extension compared with normal sleep was about a two minute um, improvement in finishing time. And, and, and Geraint Thomas this year won the Tour de France by a minute and 51 seconds. So this is a really kind of meaningful result for, for an endurance athlete. Another interesting finding um, was that there were no differences between conditions um, in the ratings of perceived exertion. So despite producing different amounts of power, the athletes always felt that they were giving a, a maximal effort. So what about um, our heart rate indices? So in short, we basically found no um, difference in any of our heart rate indices between conditions. And I've got just a couple of examples of the data on the screen there. So the first one on the left is that heart rate variability index that I showed you in the example at the start. Um, and you clearly see that there's no difference between um, the, the conditions, but there is a bit of a time effect. So there was a, a bit of an accumulation of fatigue, which is to be expected um, when you do four one-hour time trials in four consecutive days. On the right, we have the mean um, heart rate curves to that sub-maximal exercise test we did. Um, so this is uh, yeah, the curve fitting uh, for the fourth time trial. So this is after three nights of intervention and you might not be able to see from where you're sitting but there are actually dots in red, black and green on, the, on, those, um, on that graph. But I, I suppose the point is that they're almost identical. So same here, there was no difference in, in the rate at which heart rate um, increased at the start of exercise. So it seemed to be no perturbations in the cardiac autonomic response at the start of exercise. So that takes us to our psychomotor, or sorry, our psychometric indices. Um, and, and these were fairly consistent with, with all the sort of sleep research that you, you would all be familiar with. So um, for example, our, our mood was disturbed, or, or sorry, the, the cyclist's mood disturbance was greater after sleep restriction. Uh, sleepiness was lower after sleep extension and higher after sleep restriction. And response time in the psychomotor vigilance task after sleep, uh, was faster after sleep extension and slower after sleep restriction. So we wanted to drill down a little bit more on the psychomotor vigilance task results and compare it with the time trial results. So we did a linear uh, regression and correlation um, looking at the changes from time trial one to time trial four. So on the Y axis there, we've got the change in, the percentage change in psychomotor vigilance mean response time. And on the X axis, we have the percentage change um, in time trial finishing time. And you can see that there was kind of a, a moderate um, correlation there, which led us to speculate that maybe um, the changes in performance that we saw could to, to some extent be explained by lapses in motivation or lapses in, in concentration on pacing or even willingness to suffer during um, that one hour time trial. So just to summarise, um, we found that sleep extension allowed performance to be better maintained, just three nights of sleep extension performance was better maintained in these endurance cyclists, which um, to our knowledge is the first study to show these kind of effects of sleep extension in endurance athletes. We have no evidence here that cardiac autonomic indices were sensitive to the effects of sleep duration on performance, um, and the perceived exertion mood and psychomotor vigilance results suggest that mental factors, as I said, the pacing and motivational um, factors may explain our performance changes. And for sports scientists, it highlights the importance of including um, th 
those metrics in our suite of sort of athlete monitoring tools. So thank you very much. I'd just like to thank my supervisors and the Physiological Society again for getting me here. Um, yeah, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, whilst I walk up there, perhaps uh, I could start with a question. So you, you talked about sleep extension and restriction from their baseline sleep. Is their baseline sleep their habitual sleep if, if they weren't training? So, for example, would the sleep extension, are they sleeping perhaps even less than they would do normally, and such that the sleep extension is a true sleep extension or it takes them to the sleep they would have had if they're not training? Yeah, so... Um that's a good point. So we, we measured their, um, we had a base, a, a period before the actual experiment where we recorded their sleep. Um, and, and the whole study, including that baseline period where we recorded their normal or habitual sleep, was during a constant um, training load. Okay, so, so we, we made sure that they didn't train for the two days prior to any of the conditions. But the idea was that all the sleep um, data we collected, and importantly, the, the, the sleep data that we used to inform our extension and restriction, um, the training load should have been the same. And we did, we did measure training load and we saw no differences. Thanks for an interesting presentation. Um, just a question, sorry, just here. Um, just a question, in terms of the, the conditions, what was the washout period between the various conditions and did you control for things like nutrition and training? Yeah, so the, so the washout period was eight to nine days um, between conditions and, and we measured um, obviously total sleep time there and also sleep efficiency. Um, in the days prior to starting um, each um, subsequent condition, and we saw no differences there. So we think that we got their sleep, we're pretty satisfied that we got their sleep back to normal um, before each condition. And the, the second part was? It was, did you control for things like nutrition and training around yeah. the interventions? Yeah, so I mentioned the training, th the, the training. We, we did monitor their, their training, um, and, and we, so they were required to make it consistent in the washout periods between um, each condition and same with their diet. We had them record a, a food diary um, before, during and after the first condition and then they were required to repeat that for each subsequent condition. That was really interesting, thank you. Um, so you mentioned at the beginning how difficult it is for athletes to get enough sleep with traveling and time zones and things. With that in mind and the increase for the time trial performance with sleep extension, do you think you could achieve this in another way, for example, with napping? Yeah, so na napping's a really interesting um, with athletes. Uh, I mean, in general, um, I think sleep has been kind of underappreciated by athletes and their support staff. Um, but I, I was saying earlier to someone that I think um, it, it's kind of an in vogue topic with sports science at the moment. So napping is becoming a big priority for a lot of athletes. And I know that... Um, a lot of professional sporting organisations actually have sleep rooms now in their facilities and nap, napping pods and the like. So, and there is some sort of early evidence to say that napping can, can be a benefit to performance. So definitely a good way to get that ex extra sleep, yeah. And final question. Um, just a quick one. Do you have any idea about the chronotype that, that was going on with these guys? Because if you're shifting their bedtime, you could be shifting the, the, the timing of their, um, the, the tests relative to their internal time. Yeah, so that's a good question. We did, we did record chronotype with the morningness, eveningness questionnaire. Um, and, and when we did do the um, changing the, the bedtimes to get our um, extension and restriction conditions, we were actually doing it sympathetic to their chronotype. So for example, if, if they're a morning type, we wouldn't um, ask them to try and sleep in to get more sleep. We'd try and get them to, to go to bed a bit earlier. So we're trying to be sympathetic to their chronotype um, when we um, prescribe the bedtimes. And, uh, the, the testing of each day was about the same um, from started between seven and nine uh, in the morning, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And may I introduce... <laughs> Mr. Charles.